In the mountains of China lives a very unusual bear. This animal is so endangered and so hard to find, no one knows how many there are. For years, China and the U.S. have tried to save the giant panda. But it's not been easy. They are such a mystery. Their behavior is so puzzling. They've baffled scientists for years. In 1996, when a pair comes to the San Diego Zoo, hopes are raised. And when a little cub is born, she makes history. Her story has it all. International intrigue, scientific breakthroughs, and a little bit of magic. Here at the world-famous San Diego Zoo, rare exotic animals greet the public every day. But today is very special. A crowd has gathered to welcome one of the rarest animals of all. Meet Wa Mei, a baby giant panda. She was born here last August, six months ago. Today is her long-awaited public debut. A little wobbly, a little shy. She may not look important, but she is one of only 20 giant pandas ever born outside of China. Barely half of those babies survived. Wa Mei is something of a miracle. Of course, her mother, Bai Yun, is a big part of the story. But this miracle has been decades in the making, and few fully understand everything this baby means. For Wa Mei is what pandas need most, a survivor. For years, pandas have been the very symbol of wildlife conservation. Yet even now, no one knows for sure how many remain in the wild. Wame is a new beginning for her kind. Don Lindbergh is a behavior specialist for endangered species. I would say the panda ranks at the top on anybody's charismatic scale. And if we can't save an animal that has so much human appeal, there really isn't much hope of saving so many other forms that lack that same appeal. The San Diego Zoo has made it a mission to save animals, creating a department called CRESS, the Center for the Reproduction of Endangered Species. All these animals are endangered, and in captivity, they are often notoriously difficult to breed. CRESS is dedicated to bringing these animals back from the brink. Zoo experts also help many other animals. To thrive without its mother, a baby wallaroo still needs a pouch. A puppet acts as a surrogate mom for a California condor chick. Innovative research with captive animals has one all-important goal, understanding the needs of their counterparts in the wild. For endangered pandas, that's a world 7,000 miles away, high in the misty bamboo mountains of China. Pandas are such dedicated bamboo eaters They've even evolved a pseudo-thumb to grasp the stalks. But the bamboo forest is shrinking, and sometimes large patches flower all at once, seed, and then die. Then there isn't enough for the pandas to eat. In 
In the 1970s, disaster struck when a mass die-off of bamboo occurred. Many pandas died. But when another bamboo die-off began in the 1980s, the Chinese were ready. They brought the starving pandas down from the mountains and into captivity. Many came here to the Wolong Conservation Center for Giant Pandas. This is one of China's two major panda research centers. At first, Wolong keepers nursed the pandas back to health in the hope of returning them to the wild. They added milk and bread to their diet because even here, keepers can't gather enough bamboo to sustain the pandas. Each one can eat around 50 pounds of bamboo a day. So the Chinese made a kind of bamboo helper by mixing ground up bamboo with rice, corn, vitamins and minerals. The resulting flour is baked into a nutritious bread. The pandas revived and the Chinese hoped to start a breeding program. But years went by without a single birth. What's more, poaching had become a serious problem. This crippled animal lost its paw in a poacher's snare. Wolong's pandas weren't going back into the wild. By this time, pandemonium was well underway in America. In 1972, as the Cold War thawed, China offered the United States two of its national treasures. First Lady Pat Nixon was among those to welcome the pandas, the first pair to live in the United States. They were Ling Ling and Xing Xing, and they sparked our enduring love affair with pandas. Everyone was dazzled, especially their keepers. But from 14 years of caring for them, Lisa Stevens recounts a history of trial and error. In 1972, we just knew very little about pandas. Um, someone, a few someones had seen pandas occasionally out there in the wild and had seen them alone and just assumed that they were solitary. And so based on that observation, pandas were kept separate, except during breeding season. There was a lot of aggression when we first tried to mate Ling Ling and Xing Xing. There was a lot of chasing and fighting and a lot of aggressive behavior. And during that time, Xing Xing was never able to um, gain an effective breeding posture. Um, he was the subject of sort of brutal press. Not only the pandas are frustrated. Uh, Xing has not uh, learned how to properly orient himself. Why not? I wish you could tell me that. I, uh, in six years, you would expect he would have learned. He is Xing Xing, age 11, with a well-deserved reputation as an inept lover. It wasn't really until the 80s that we realized that pandas probably encountered each other occasionally in the wild, maybe around their favorite patch of bamboo. And once we began socializing Ling Ling and Xing Xing outside of the breeding season, it was remarkable. The very next breeding season, they bred successfully. After more than six years of trying, one of Washington's most famous couples has mated. The big question tonight at the National Zoo is, is Ling Ling pregnant or not? The answer, a resounding yes. In fact, Ling Ling would give birth to five cubs in all. But each time, something was terribly wrong with the newborns. There was the tremendous excitement and the thrill of having a panda cub born, quickly followed by the disappointment of its death. The cubs had contracted a bacterial infection that no antibiotic could contain. In 1991, Ling Ling died. Xing Xing spent his remaining seven years alone America's most loved couple had ended their romance without a single cub.
There was a lot of excitement in San Diego this week, something that you might call sheer pandemonium. Two pandas from China, Xi Xi and Bai Yun, finally made it to the States in the San Diego Zoo. This after four years of red tape and three million dollars in costs. 25 years after the first pair arrived, we got a second chance. Accompanied by a team of Chinese scientists, the pandas arrived on a 12-year loan. China hoped Cress could help solve the puzzle of panda reproduction. Bayun and Shishi came to us from the Wolong Center. Shishi was a wild-caught male who had been severely injured and was nursed back to health. He was unable to go back into the wild. Bayun, on the other hand, was the first captive birth at Wolong to survive beyond a few days. So China parted with a very special animal when they sent us Bayun. Behaviorist Ron Swaysgood quickly noticed the differences between San Diego's newest couple. Bayun is very outgoing, energetic, playful. She's uh, constantly active uh, and interactive. And uh, Shishi, on the other hand, he's an older male. He's a little tired, perhaps. He's focused on his food. Bayun and Shishi are night and day in terms of their personalities. state-of-the-art technology and closed-circuit cameras monitor the pair around the clock. Everything about their elaborate enclosure was designed with science and research in mind. Three bedrooms, two exhibit yards, a garden, a sunroom, and two exercise yards make up the panda enclosure. But before they meet the public, they face four weeks of quarantine and an extensive medical exam. The panda has long defied classification. For years, science couldn't decide if the panda was in the bear or the raccoon family. Its coarse fur doesn't seem to belong to either one. Its teeth and jawbones are larger than a bear's. But DNA testing has finally solved the puzzle. The panda is a most unusual bear. Okay, here's her liver. Let's go a little bit deeper. Bai Yun receives the first of many sonograms. Good. Following Chinese advice, the San Diego staff talks to her and hand feeds her, gaining her trust. Bai Yun allows them to shave her belly and give her a sonogram, all without any anesthesia. She is fantastic. You guys are great. I think it was, what, three weeks ago we were down here and they said they'd have her trained in three weeks. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. It's more cooperative than domestic animals. How's it going this morning? As the pandas settled in, Ron noticed a problem with Shishi. The old male seemed listless. When Shishi came to San Diego, he had some behavior problems. He was a little withdrawn in his temperament and personality. And uh, we wanted him to get out of his shell, to interact with, with his environment. So we gave him objects to investigate or play with. So that keeps him mentally active and gives him uh, both physical and mental exercise. Shishi's psychological well-being is a cause for concern. If he's at all distressed, it could affect his ability to mate. Keeping animals mentally stimulated has been an ongoing challenge for zoos. Life in the wild offers infinite possibilities. So zoos have come up with enrichment programs where animals can forage as they do in the wild. The enrichment helps Shishi. He's more alert, and his diet is varied. But just what a panda should eat has always been a puzzle. 
nutritionist Mark Edwards finds them biological contradictions. The thing that makes pandas so amazing for nutritionists is it's, it's a species that um, their anatomy and their diet don't match. Pandas have adapted to eat this, this herbivorous diet, and yet they have the digestive system of a carnivore. So even though on the outside, pandas may appear to have a lot of specialized adaptations for processing bamboo, like the modified wrist bone that acts like a thumb. They certainly have very broad uh, teeth that allow them to crush and grind the bamboo, and they have very large uh, jaw muscles that help them crush the bamboo. Beyond that, they have a digestive system very similar to a household dog. And so how they take advantage of and digest bamboo um, is still somewhat of a mystery. In fact, pandas don't digest bamboo well at all. By adding vitamin supplements, Mark is constantly improving their diet. Because the pandas get so little out of the food that they eat, they have to spend an enormous amount of time actually eating. They can't really accumulate a lot of fat like other bears, which would allow them to hibernate. So unlike black bears or grizzly bears, the pandas actually don't hibernate. They're active year-round, processing and eating and foraging for food in, in the mountains of China. After 30 days, the pandas are deemed healthy. Their quarantine is over. The public is eager to greet the pair. Bai Yun and Shishi Shi are such a hit, the enthusiastic crowds need a gentle reminder to give the pandas some peace. Each day brings a chance to visit one of the most endangered and endearing animals in the world. There's something intriguing about even their most obvious traits. Take their black and white coat. Is it intended as camouflage? Or does it give these solitary animals an easy way to spot each other? Will we ever know? Interested volunteers watch and record their behavior. A creature with so many secrets demands good detectives. The key is to zero in on one problem at a time. We decided to focus our research effort on how pandas communicate. And because they are solitary mammals, they rely heavily on their sense of smell. And that's how they read the community bulletin board, so to speak. You know, this is where they get their information of what's going on in a community of pandas. Pandas have a large gland, which they rub against surfaces to leave scent marks. When Bai Yun scent marks more frequently, the panda team knows she's getting closer to ovulation. Okay. So 112596. Timing Bai Yun's cycle is tricky because female pandas ovulate only once a year and are fertile for just three days. She marked it in her sunroom. The team prepares for the upcoming mating season. <laughs> Bai Yun and Shishi Shi have always been kept in separate enclosures, even when on exhibit. Now they need to get acquainted. Already familiar with each other's scent, they finally meet face to face just a fence apart. It was a pretty mellow interaction. There was no aggression, which is what we hoped, and they were interested, but marginally interested in one another. But this is early in, in the estrus cycle, and we expect as she reaches peak estrus to see much more interaction. It'll be much more dramatic in the future. In the endocrinology lab, Nancy Sakala is learning to interpret Bai Yun's hormonal cycles. We need to look at hormone levels on a daily basis, to look at stress and to look at estrogen levels, getting ready for ovulation. We can't go and bleed a panda every day. It would, it's totally inappropriate. So we look for those hormone levels in urine samples. After months of routine testing, the levels have peaked. Immediately, the pandas are taken off exhibit and turned out into the backyard. 
For the first time, they'll be able to make physical contact. Come on, bye. Bai Yun is a frisky five-year-old. Shi Shi is pushing 20. Will this age difference matter? Shi Shi. I don't want him to get startled. That'll start something right away. Let me, let me get him turned around. Can you hold me? Keep it up here, no. Shi Shi. Hey. Okay, here we go. <laughs> she she shows only aggression. Shishi's reaction comes as both a surprise and a disappointment to the panda team. In the case of Shishi, he was not very curious about his surroundings, and particularly about a dynamic young female who was putting her scent everywhere in his vicinity. He simply didn't respond to this. So it raises questions in our minds about how good is his sense of smell? Shishi -shi was found with a severely injured nose after a fight in the wild. Could this injury have damaged his ability to smell? Will he ever be able to mate? It will be another year before the pair can try again. To learn more about panda breeding, the team from San Diego comes to the source, China, and the research center at Wolong. The work with pandas is part of an ongoing collaboration between China and the San Diego Zoo that began 20 years ago. Since Bai Yun was born here in 1991, there have been 16 successful births. 23 pandas live in Wolong, making this the ideal place to study the full range of panda behavior. And to learn about pandas, you must begin with a lesson in human relations. It's a little awkward, you know, you're new, you're strange, and there's cultural and language differences. But uh, within a few weeks, I started joining the, the basketball team there. And we had a great time playing basketball together, and developed a lot of camaraderie. And that really helped, um, not just in developing our friendships, but in our scientific collaboration. We felt more comfortable with one another because we were friends. Well, this right here, see how they're rolling about on top of each other? That's what we need to try to find a, a good way to describe with our new project. One of their joint projects is to set common standards for recording panda behavior. The team has also brought over the latest high-tech equipment, incubators, video cameras, and the latest in digital instruments. Meg Sutherland is here to study the cubs. What's important to me when, when, I'm, when I'm approaching um, a, you know, a young animal of any species is trying to figure out you know, what's normal for that species and what's not normal for that species. Because when a, a baby gets sick, a lot of times it's subtle. And so it's trying to get a feel for what's their behavior, how active are they, and getting um, a feel for just handling the babies. <laughs> His tongue sticking out. <laughs> oh, 
really sounds good. They had a uh, rescued baby panda that had been at Wolong for several months. And her disposition was totally different, you know, than the other pandas. She was quite the fireball. She did not like being handled, and we basically just couldn't, you know, we couldn't examine her. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I don't want to like that. Yeah, yeah. Does, um... <laughs> that was interesting to see the difference, you know, between her and her situation of having been in the wild and, you know, mother reared relative to, um, you know, the other pandas that have had, you know, more human contact and have been in captivity. The Chinese invoke a hands-on philosophy when it comes to pandas. With this approach, the keepers develop an intimate relationship with their animals. This panda mother has such trust in her keeper, she allows him to come this close to her and her newborn. Wo Long is the world leader in panda breeding, but even they have a lot to overcome. Infant mortality is still high, and there is a lot to learn about panda mothers. It's nearly impossible to observe a panda rearing a baby naturally in the wild. What we need to do is find out what makes a good panda mother, what makes a poor panda mother, what are the different mothering styles, and which ones work better. So we need to have a detailed account, a detailed description of the kinds of things that mothers do to keep their infants warm, fed, and, and to survive. These infants are so helpless, they, can't, they can hardly move or crawl at all when they're first born, and the mother has to pick them up with her, with her mouth. And she does this very gently, and she even she holds her head down so that the weight of the infant doesn't rest on her teeth. If she held, held her mouth like this, all the weight of the infant would be on the teeth, and it might actually puncture the infant. So they, they really know how to handle them in their mouth. It's a pretty amazing thing to see such a large animal with such big teeth and powerful jaws, picking up a little baby that uh, you would think would easily be killed or injured, but they're very gentle. But mothering doesn't come easily to every female panda. For reasons that we don't understand, some females in captivity react with fear to their infant once it's born. So they abandon the infant. And in the context of a, of a situation where infants taken to the nurseries rarely survive, one would hope that an alternate solution to this kind of problem would be to change the behavior of the mother. The keepers take the baby away and concentrate on training the mother. They give her a toy panda, scented with her own milk and her cub's urine. Slowly, she begins treating it like a real baby. Very, very gradually, her mothering of the doll improved to the point where it was decided the original infant could be brought back to her. Uh, she would care for it, and then she would have lapses so it would be taken back to the nursery, and then the next day, the same process, try it again. Eventually, she took it and kept it. The increasing number of births in captivity revealed an astonishing secret. Almost half the time, pandas have twins. Yet the mother chooses only one to care for. If the team could find a way to keep both cubs alive, it would double panda reproduction. Pathologist Bruce Rideout is trying to find some answers. Females often give birth to twins, but they're only going to rear one of them. The staff here very often ends up in a situation where they're trying to hand raise a newborn panda infant. Not only are they very small and difficult to feed, but because the mothers basically reject one of the twins from day one, that twin does not get the antibody-rich first milk that the mother has to give the infant. That makes their immune system essentially non-functional in the early stages. 
So we suspect, although we haven't proven yet, that a lot of the youngsters that are hand-reared are dying within the first week from bacterial infections. And if we can come up with a means of increasing the survivability of those infants, then they're going to have a lot more pandas at Wulong. Saving both twins would be the breakthrough the team needs. She's in the mood and he could care less. But that's panda love at the San Diego Zoo. Zookeeper say Bayoun shows every sign of being in heat. But so far, she, she shows no interest. Back home, it's breeding season number two, and the pressure's on. We're very confident that Bai Yun will do her part. Our greatest concern is with Shishi. What will it take to motivate this male to become interested in her? It's as though his brain were short-circuited in some way. He simply does not seem to react to her as a potential mate. His behavior was that of a territorial intruder. And so he responded at every initiative by trying to uh, repel her, to get her to move away. Shishi's behavior is baffling. Such hostility is usually aimed at another male. Ron has been studying male aggression at Wolong. Males fight over territory, females, or both. <coughs> to avoid real violence, males also engage in a more subtle contest. This is called a handstand scent mark used by males to intimidate each other. The higher you can place your scent, the bigger you must be. Scent is the key to panda communication. To study how the pandas react to various scent marks, Ron collects them. Each scent mark carries an enormous amount of information, such as the sex, age, and the breeding condition of that panda. Ron has discovered that presented with both a familiar scent and a new one, pandas are much more curious about the new one. Given the importance of scent in panda society, the San Diego team takes a closer look at Shishi. An MRI reveals internal damage to his nose. This could explain his lack of interest in Bai Yoon. This thing right here is okay. huge yeah. thing. It's cool, so. But further tests show there is nothing really wrong with his sense of smell. When keepers hide food in his enclosure, he sniffs it out just fine. His problem could be psychological. His fight in the wild may have been so traumatic he now avoids contact with any panda. With time running out on the second breeding season, the team intercedes. Bai Yun undergoes artificial insemination with Shishi's sperm. As usual, they have been monitoring Bai Yun's hormone levels and time the procedure based on their best guess. Yeah, you're in. Right. After inseminating her twice in two days, the team can only wait and see. The panda watch lasts an agonizingly long time, from March to late October. When she shows every sign of being pregnant, the team is elated. But their hopes are crushed when it turns out to be a false alarm. Another breeding season ends, with no baby to show for it. It's one year later, 
And with hopes raised again, the zoo builds by Yoon a choice of dens. She's been artificially inseminated again, and this time, Bai Yoon starts to build a nest. I'm Dr. Don Lindbergh, giant panda team leader. We are very proud to announce the first birth of a giant panda here at the world famous San Diego Zoo. Good morning, America. After years of trying, Bai Yoon is finally a mother. Immediately, her tiny four-ounce newborn is a media star. I understand that you're monitoring the progress of the baby panda with a video camera. Why is it not a good idea to actually go into the den at this time? Well, it would be a little crowded in there, but uh, I don't know of anyone who's willing to go in uh, a, a small space with uh, an animal that's very bear-like in its uh, behavior. It wouldn't be safe, uh, for one thing, uh, but we also do not want to interfere with a natural process that seems to be going very well. The infant is blind and completely helpless. Just keeping it warm and fed takes all of Bai Yoon's time and energy. Devoted, she stays with her baby for five days before finally leaving her den for her first drink of water. Captive born herself and a first time mom, Bai Yoon has exceeded everyone's expectations. In a month, the cub is developing its black and white coat and the vets have discovered she's a girl. She begins a routine of weekly examinations. The San Diego Zoo's new baby giant panda is getting worldwide attention. The five-week-old cub remains secluded with its mother, Bai Yoon, in a birthing den. But the whole world is watching their every move via Panda Cam on the zoo's website. Since Panda Cam was launched four days ago, 93,000 people from 43 countries have logged on to get a peek. They can see everything from Bai Yoon nursing her baby to the two of them snuggling for a nap. The cub takes all the attention in stride. But she's also learning to assert herself. Eyes are open. At two months, her eyes were fully open. But she won't be able to walk until she's five months old. And it will be four months after that when she takes her first bite of bamboo. Each achievement is a small turning point for this cub, reassuring the staff that yes, this little girl is going to be all right. It seemed like each time we would have the opportunity to examine Wame, there would be you know something new, something else that was just amazing. Check your eyes. During one of the examinations, um, she was being videoed. And she actually sort of uh, responded aggressively to the videographer. I mean, it, it all kind of startled us because it was like, whoa, what did she do? What did she do? It was kind of like, you know, baby's first step. Oh, what was that? A small army, including four vets, six specialists, four keepers, and five volunteers, have devoted the last three months to this cub's survival. They write down every little thing about her. Only her baby book will be the first scientific documentation of how a giant panda grows up. 
Now, as is true for all Chinese babies, a time-honored celebration marks her 100th day. In Chinese, Huamei. In English, China, USA. Thank you. Hua Mei receives her name. She's become a true Chinese-American daughter. reaches another milestone. Bai Yun takes her out to the garden room for her first look at the outside world. Surprised, she's not sure what to make of it. Hua Mei's success is not the only thing to celebrate. There's more good news from China. Wo Long is in the midst of a baby boom. 1999 proved to be a banner year. Eight surviving youngsters. All the information exchange, cooperation, and trust is paying off. What we've done is try to work with them in developing a formula and, and rearing methods that best match the mothers. With his Chinese colleagues, Mark designed an improved infant formula that gave a tremendous boost to cub survival. But the real breakthrough behind Wolong's success was in conquering the twin problem they found an ingenious way of getting mothers to raise both twins. It involves a clever switch. The keepers take an infant away from its mother. This infant is hurried to the nursery. It's really a seamless change. We try to keep them as similar as possible so that the babies aren't subjected to unnecessary changes that might compromise their, their health. The keeper returns with a different cub, the twin that the mother had initially rejected. The mother accepts the cub. This twin swapping allows each twin to get its mother's milk and care, and she's able to raise both cubs, one at a time, without taxing herself. None of this would have been possible without the trust between panda and keeper. With so many irresistible new cubs, Wo Long has become a tourist attraction. And more success has followed. In the year 2000, Wo Long broke even its record with 11 new cubs. China's breeding program is finally going strong. Wo Long's success gives us a certain optimism about the future of giant pandas. But with this comes another problem. What will we do with this surplus of captive cubs? Their natural habitat is vanishing. China's human population puts enormous demands on the land. Farming and logging are clearing the forests where pandas once lived. Pandas are pushed higher and higher up the mountains 
into the toughest terrain where there's less to eat. To combat this problem, the Chinese government has set aside 32 reserves for the giant panda. But the reserves are spread far apart and fragmented. The panda population is actually split into all these little small islands of populations, and there's no exchange of individuals between these areas. One of the applications of our scent research might be to take these scents and put them in habitat corridors that we put between these islands. And this may indeed encourage the pandas to come down out of one island, traverse through the corridor, and up to another island. And this will get genetic exchange and reduce the problems of inbreeding in these small populations. But panda field work is still tackling the basics. Researcher Matt Dernan joins Chinese colleagues here at 9,000 feet to study pandas in the wild. Matt is trying to find out just how many pandas are left and where they are. Perpendicular. It's thought that less than 1,000 remain, but no one really knows. I've been in the field three years and I've only seen one panda in the wild, which is obviously very frustrating. 20 years ago, Researchers relied on live animal traps, like this one. The pandas were radio collared and released. Today, new technology gives us a way to study pandas without actually ever seeing them. This high-tech method uses a simple barbed wire. The wire plucks hairs off the animals as they walk underneath. Through advanced DNA analysis, these collected hairs can tell us not only how many pandas there are in this area, but their sex, age, and who's related to whom. Matt is also finding that pandas need more than bamboo. We've learned from previous work that um, in the Wuipeng study area, if you simply took um, bamboo, there should be more pandas up there. So the question is, what may be limiting the size of that population? It's possible that there are too few den sites. It seems female pandas choose larger trees for their dens, but logging has taken the biggest and the best of them. If there are, in fact, uh, too few large trees, and it does turn out that they prefer to use large trees, we may, for example, want to introduce artificial den sites to try to uh, help the female pandas uh, reproduce better and rear their offspring. Matt is mapping panda territories. With an increasing captive population, there's a growing hope for reintroduction. The information we know about behaviors that we've learned from captivity and the information we're gaining from our work in the field are going to be critical to the success of any future reintroduction. We don't, for example, want to put a male into an area that's already saturated with males. That animal may lose out. It's coming from captivity, and we do know that when they come together in the mating season, there is some aggression. What we learn about giant pandas in the wild will make a big difference in how we care for them in captivity. And more importantly, we may one day know enough to be able to return them to the bamboo mountains where they belong. At the San Diego Zoo, they are preparing for a party. This is a cool cake. It has her name on it. It has a one on it. We're coming in. Hold on, hold on, folks. Folks, folks. Oh, my gosh. 
the public has come out in full force to honor its favorite daughter. There is a very important birthday being celebrated today in San Diego, California. The first surviving giant panda cub ever born in the United States is turning one year old. It's easy to see why Wa Mei is an international star. But that's not her only claim to fame. In looking at this cub, we're reminded of all we can achieve with breakthroughs in science. And by working together, we can change the future for endangered animals everywhere. I believe Wame's significance is not that she's one more panda in a small population. It's not that she may go back to the wild. She won't. It's in what she is doing to inform. And it's what she's doing to attract people to, to them and to care about them. You won't save something you don't care about. Since Wa Mei's birth in 1999, we now have a panda pair in Atlanta and another in the National Zoo. Today, the U.S. boasts an unprecedented six panda adults and Wa Mei. Wa Mei has no inkling of everything that's come before, no idea of how much she means. She's just enjoying her birthday. And we're celebrating with her, as we will for all her birthdays to come. To learn more about what you've seen on this nature program, visit PBS online at pbs.org or America Online keyword PBS.